Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Carsten. I'm a hacker. And we're talking about how to uplift security for all of us in, in the Polkadot and Substrate ecosystem. Um, as a short summary, we have already made great progress in finding bugs, the diagnosis, um, still lots of improvement potential on actually fixing the bugs. So we are sitting on a larger and larger pile of known bugs these days. Um, let me ask with a question. Uh, let, let me start with a, asking a question to, to all of you. Um, of these three, which one would you consider most important in uplifting the security of our ecosystem? I'll, I'll give you a moment to, to think about it while perhaps properly introducing myself first. Um, so I've been in cryptography for, for well over a decade, well before um, crypto became a, a blockchain term. So uh, my PhD dealt with designing small encryption functions for, for microchips. Um, and so, yeah, the, the field obviously has evolved, and, and so has, has uh, my interest. Um, I started SR Labs, a small consulting firm out of Berlin in Germany in 2010, and we've helped many different industries go through digitization, digital transformation, and a lot of what I'll be talking about today is informed by those experiences in other industries that have encountered very similar challenges to the scaling crypto ecosystems now, but they've already solved them, so there's a lot to borrow from. Um, I should also mention that I'm not a developer myself, I don't have development background, um, but after a, a few introductory remarks from me, I'll be inviting uh, two colleagues from Parity on stage. They, they're more on the development side to have a little bit of an exchange and um, see um, how to balance security and innovation speed and those things. So that's coming up right after this presentation. Coming back to this question, what's most important to avoid making mistakes? to notice when you do make mistakes, or to fix those mistakes after you notice them. I think it's easy to agree if we can avoid all bugs, that's the way to go. But experience says, and not just from the crypto ecosystem, that would be a naive assumption that we can avoid all bugs, right? We should try as much as possible, but innovation is an unclean art or, or craft. Um, mistakes have to be made for us to learn from them, right? So we can't avoid all the bugs. I think it's also easy to agree that finding a bug without fixing it is kind of pointless, right? You might just as well not have looked for it. So it's really about avoiding the bugs and fixing the bugs. But we're, we're going to learn what to avoid and what to fix. So really, we need all three, right? It's the, really the balancing of finding bugs, fixing them quickly, and learning from your mistakes so you don't make those mistakes anymore going forward. Right? And it's really that balancing of these three forces that I want to discuss today, um, starting with, with finding bugs. And we've gotten a lot better at finding bugs through really four different means that most blockchain projects at one point or another um, will implement. And they are complementary, so you should probably be implementing most of them, if not all of them, um, because they, they um, focus on really different areas. So um, you should always start with some internal tooling, some internal processes for finding bugs while you're writing code. The sooner you get feedback about your code, the better. You, you still want to be in that mindset of, of writing the code, and then some, some tool is going to tell you, oh, you made a security mistake here. You can act on it right away. You just learn something about your own coding practices. Right? Now, you'll start relatively bare bones. Um, you're not going to have the security experts. You're not going to have the greatest tool set. But it's important to have a process where people get used to, to triaging their own security mistakes. Um, in times where, where you um, plan a big release, where um, things get real, you could lose a lot of money, um, you don't want to solicit um, the support of, of an external audit firm, somebody who is doing nothing other than blockchain audits, and who knows where to find for these elusive bugs that ultimately break chains. Um, you do this at most a couple of times per year, a dedicated audit, or you have continuous support from a partner who just looks at your, your PRs, right? So those two are complementary, um, but they both have the same goal of kind of educating your developers towards a better understanding how to avoid bugs. Not every project will be able to implement both of them. Um, therefore, a third pillar was introduced a, a few years ago where the community says, 
we all benefit from the security reputation of, in this case, Polkadot and Substrate. So we all suffer if somebody was in Polkadot and Substrate gets hacked. So shouldn't we pool some funds and help everyone, at least to a minimum baseline level of security? And there's a number of initiatives that, that do that, help everyone reach that minimum baseline level. And if between those three, something still slips through, then people implement these bug bounties saying, if you could find something despite our best effort, um, we'll, we'll pay you handsomely for it. Um, let me double click into each of those and, and give you my thoughts as to, as to uh, where they're best placed in the development process and how to think about these different pillars. Um, starting with the first two, the, the internal code reviews and the, the individual audits. Um, like I said, it's the, the, the main starting point here is to, to get people used to working on security bug as part of their, their normal development. And um, you want to start as, as simple as possible. One possible place to start is to implement some, some free tools just as part of your, your development pipelines. Um, we publish um, the, the fast testing um, harnesses and, and tools that we come up with in our commercial work as free and open source software. So um, as long as you're within Substrate, which is really what we are focusing on, um, that's the best place to start, I think. Right? Just include some, some free fast testers, and it will produce uh, bugs. We'll, we'll look at some statistics and um, how in uh, the Substrate ecosystem, the su through the Substrate Builder program, those fast testers have found a bunch of bugs. Right? And your goal really is to, to have this loop where every time a developer um, completes a feature and brings it to, to launch, they also will have learned something about security, right? So it's self-propelling and self-uplifting within the range of what a developer can, can use through free and open source tools, right? You complement that then uh, through commercial audits, usually around the time of a, of, a, of a bigger launch where you put additional code at risk of being hacked. And those audits are basically doing the same, but amplified with more expertise, but also give you something else, and that's a threat model. And a threat model really encapsulates how criminals, hackers, would look at your chain. It, it, would, it would answer the question, why would somebody want to break into your business logic, your code base? What is there for them to gain? And enlist a number of ways that, in theory, this could happen. And that really introduces a way of thinking about security that focuses attention, where if you do have that short list of those are the really vulnerable points that criminals know, if they can break those, they'll get rich. That's the same vulnerable points that during your development you'll put extra security attention on. Right? So you do need a threat model at some point, and it's best written, of course, with, an, with a partner who does this regularly. Um, Double-clicking on, on the next area, these shared audit initiatives. Um, there, there's several of them um, currently running. I'm revisiting one here that has uh, recently ended, and that, that's now um, left to the community to continue. And I think that'll be one of the topics that we'll pick up in the panel. Um, this was part of the Substrate Builder program that um, dozens of, of projects went through and went through very successfully. Um, it wasn't just security, right? So around the second milestone, about halfway going through the Substack Builder program, there was a security checkpoint where we would do a one-week assessment, a semi-automated, so heavily driven by fast testing, and we covered um, 63 chains across two years um, in, this, uh, in these assessments. And as you can see here, we found um, about two important bugs per chain on average. So these, um, this initiative really helped pointing all of these teams at a relatively early stage during the development to the importance of security and get them to start thinking about security, get them uh, raise their awareness about these fast testing tools that they can then include in the development processes. Um, as you're going through this list of the types of, of issues that, that were most uh, often discovered. Now, this is partly, of course, influenced by what kind of mistakes uh, the projects made, but also by what kind of bugs a fast testing setup can typically find. And what's notably missing from this are logic bugs. So fast testers, 
I mean, should have introduced this a little bit earlier since I keep talking about it, but are basically attempts to, to crash a computer program, right? Throw inputs at them millions and millions of times and see if any of those inputs crash the program, in which case you've kind of driven it into an undefined state. Something must have gone wrong. The developer certainly didn't want the program to crash, right? Um, and logic bugs, of course, they don't necessarily lead to, um, to, to crashes, or, or rarely do they do. But we are currently working um, on a way to actually bring logic bugs into the range of fast, what fast testing can cover, um, and that's by using, reusing, basically the test cases that you all are already writing for your project. So you're already um, writing in your test cases a lot of assumptions around, oh, those um, logic boundaries should not be crossed, right? We're using them and making assert statements out of them for the fast tester, so if any of these logic constraints are violated, the program does crash, right? Um, making really good progress in this for our commercial work, making that a lot more um, effective and efficient, um, and uh, as soon as this is uh, matured a little bit more, we'll bring it back to the, to the free and open source versions as well, so you can all benefit from that. But, so the, the Substrate Builder program, um, like I mentioned, has, has completed, um, but it's now more a community-driven effort that will hopefully pick up from it, helping um, project at a relatively early stage in the development process mature. Hello, welcome. Um, there are some other initiatives. I should probably point out the Polka.audit lesion that helps project a little bit later, basically when there's already a lot of value at risk to add that additional um, assurance, often by paying for a commercial audit, right? Closing the loop to, to the first two that we talked about. So there was the, the first three types of, of security findings or, or initiatives that, that bring security findings. There's one more, the bug bounties. Um, I have some strong thoughts on bug bounties. I think they're, uh, they're, they're brilliant for, and used in a lot of industries. Um, however, d this particular um, industry, um, of course, is a little bit more prone to, to, um, to, to go to, to bug bounties based on the belief that if you set the right economic incentives, you can fix anything in the world. And it's often not that easy. Um, these headliner numbers, you know, bil billions paid out, trillions of, of um, damage averted, um, they're only half of the story, and they're kind of the marketing side of the story. I'll tell you what really um, is, is going on. Um, you, you, you're attracting attention from whitehead researchers whose job it is to find bugs, and they go where they think they'll be fairly compensated for that, or most fairly compensated for that, and then they come across a million dollar reward somewhere, and of course they'll put attention on that. And they might even get lucky and find a critical bug. Now in most cases, reporting a bug on a million dollar bounty is not leading to a million dollar payout. The project will try to negotiate that down, and, and too often times have I seen that the projects then pay out somewhere 5,000, 10,000. So a huge disappointment to the researcher, right? Because of course you can't afford uh, to pay million dollar bounties all the time, right? So the right level of, of incentive is somewhere a large amount of money for a researcher, call it $50,000 put that as a reward, it would still attract attention and it will not lead to the disappointment of then having to negotiate down people, right? So set these reward levels so that whitehead researchers are attracted to them. Do not set them to try to convince criminals not to be criminals anymore. That has never worked and will never work. Criminals will not go through the paperwork of explaining the bug to you. They're not going to disclose the identities and bank accounts, so you can go through KYC with your crypto exchange. They just, they'll stay criminals, right? Don't try to incentivize them away from what they're already doing, but assume that there is probably 10 uh, ethical researchers for every one criminal in this ecosystem, so it's the attention of, of those 10 that you're trying to capture with these bounty rewards, right? And if you can get a little bit of marketing from it as well, so be it. But as a, as a security guy, to me, that, that should be an afterthought. So between these four things, we're really good at, at finding a lot of bugs and, you know, literally hundreds, right? There's hundreds of, of, of important bugs being tracked uh, across all of the different Polkadot um, parachains right now. And who's going to fix all of these bugs now? This is really the existential question that, that determines whether we are 
receiving a security uplift or just enumerating all the ways that hackers will ultimately get us, right? Um, and just a few thoughts on, on, on this. Um, Right now, we're not very good at an ecosystem because of two, two problems. Nobody seems to be um, accountable, and nobody knows where to start right, within each of the projects. So there, there is a list of bugs now. So what? Who was responsible for this piece of code six months ago? I don't know. Where is this library coming from? Some vendor. We'll write an email to them. There's all of these complications in process. If you're, if, if you're looking at an unstructured list of bugs, most of which are not intuitive to understand to the developer. If they understood the bug, they wouldn't have created it in the first place. So it's, it's often tricksy combinations of things that lead to these bugs, right? Um, and now basically this is a communication breakdown between security people and developers, right? And somebody now needs to build a bridge between these two worlds so that we're not speaking about different things in different languages anymore, but that we can really start prioritizing. And you can build those bridge from, from from either side. When you're building it, I know there's kind of a philosophical debate over which is better, right? If you're building it from the developer side, you call this security champions. So with each tribe or squad of developers, you would say, that guy is responsible for security now. Please, you know, learn up and educate everyone else around you, right? Security champion. If you're sending people the other way around, from the security team into the development teams, you call that security ambassadors. So ambassador, of course, the, the metaphor would suggest you have a home country, security, but you spend most of your time in another country. You're deployed as an ambassador. And th that other country would be one or more development teams that you spend most of the time in. Now, optimally, of course, you would build the bridge in both directions and somewhere meet in the middle, but you have to start somewhere. And experience says the ambassador route is definitely the more successful one to start with because you don't first have to educate people on security. They already know about security. They just have to spend time with the development teams. They spend time in a weekly meeting. They keep mentioning security, but also at the same time, they keep understanding the context in which a tribe or squad thinks. What are their, their priorities? What are their next milestones? And they try to then articulate security priorities within that context, explaining why a developer wants their code to be more secure, rather than just saying, here's a ticket with a language you don't understand. Right? Um, so ambassadors have been introduced, security ambassadors, that is, um, in, in many industries. And um, we, we, we started with Parity about yeah, a, a little bit more than a year ago. Um, and the success from the first year um, of running this, this ambassador program is, is overwhelming. Um, the number of bugs themselves has about halved. Now, that, that wouldn't feel like a great uh, achievement if it weren't for most of these bugs being fresh bugs, right? Um, know that there's always new bugs coming in through testing, and most of these bugs, of course, are, are not on-chain, right? So there's always code that's being reviewed um, before it's going on-chain. So you'll never drive this down to zero. And halving the number of open bugs, that's, that's a major achievement. Even more um, noteworthy is that the number of orphaned uh, issues, basically issues that have seen no traction recently, um, has gone down by, by a factor of three. Um, so that's really uh, the two metrics you want to be tracking. How many bugs do you have open, and how many of those are somehow being forgotten, right? Um, and the ambassadors, of course, they achieve more than just you know uh, number crunching. They were also able, and of course I'll, I'll let the parity colleagues comment on this a little bit more later, um, but they were also able to introduce a, a common language and way to think about security with the developers through these continuous exchanges by a security person sitting in your stand-up meetings, in your weekly status meetings, right? And always introducing a little bit more and a little bit more. You're bringing everyone onto that same page, thinking about security as one of the core properties of our product. And yeah, so that experience was, was very positive, um, bringing me to, to my conclusions already before uh, opening the panel discussion, that I'm, I'm, I'm finding that we have gotten a lot better at diagnosis, almost too good, you know, hundreds of bucks being tracked, literally millions spent on this, not just through these, these inflated bounties, but through all of these different ways, and a much, much, much smaller fraction of resources goes into the healing, what comes after that. Right? Is it ambassadors? Is it something else? How do we melt down that, that pile of issues we have already found? 
Right? So I look forward to discussing this now with, with uh, the two colleagues, uh, Serhan and Gio, from, both from Parity. Um, yeah, Serhan heads the, the AppSec team, so basically responsible for everything we just discussed, and, and Gio works in that team. Yeah, so please join me here. Um, and we want to make this as, as interactive of a session as possible, of course, right? So uh, your, your questions are paramount in driving us forward. I prepared a few questions on my phone. I just don't have my phone anymore. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, you want to just quickly introduce yourselves? Yeah, for sure. Let me start. So this is Serhan Bahar, head of AppSec uh, at Parity. My job is to manage application security program across the company mostly interact with the ecosystem to help them and enable them to uh, measure their application security programs and security processes. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Giovanni Gongora. Uh, I'm an application security engineer. Uh, I work in Serhan's team. Uh, we are part of the team that is always delivering not so good news to engineers. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, uh, we're, uh, we may, mainly we are here to help, mainly. Yeah, spectacular. And now, um, I was describing this, this philosophical question on um, if you want to build a bridge between security and developers, who, who has to start building the bridge? Do you expect the developers to become security professionals, or do we as security people have to, to be, become more sensitive to developer needs? Where, where do you come down? So it seems, to, it seems like a chicken-egg problem. Uh, to answer this, maybe we should look at what does it mean security for different stakeholders. So, uh, one thing can come in my mind is firstly, we have security team, we have developers, we have business owner, and also we have the users. So if you look at from the user perspective, security is important because there, there, there should be nothing about security to continue the activities. If, if you look at from the security perspective, security people too much oriented for the security. The only purpose is to secure the things. For developers, it's, it's, it's a mix of it. It should be available, it should be confidential, it should be, uh, the integrity should work like in just security, but they are not only focused on the security, they are also focused on the delivering the things. But if you look at the business side, in the business side, I believe there is three important uh, aspects. So managing the risk and also putting adequate security with the low cost. So to answer this question, I believe we need to understand who, who, who do what in the worst, uh, which stage. As you mentioned in your presentation, we can implement this with security champions uh, at the beginning of the development process, but it's not always feasible for everybody. Sometimes too big organizations cannot manage this. It, it could be too costly. Sometimes too little or too small teams cannot manage it because there is no way to do it to assign the capacity. So I believe it's very important to combine sometimes if you need security champions, sometimes with ambassador uh, to look at the risk-based approach. Uh, maybe the, my, my overall answer would be uh, it should be risk-based approach. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, from the engineer side, uh, I'm thinking that uh, it, it always depends on the maturity of the engineer. It depends on the experience that he has. If he comes from an organization before where they have a security point of view, uh, most likely the engineers are the ones who are going to be taking care of their role, like the independence role, will not exist. Of course, that's not what happens, it's not always the case. Uh, but uh, at some point, I think if, if you have a team that is not mature enough or is not mm -hmm. aware enough of the security, then it's up to the security engineers to come and try to bring guidance and, and, and route things, it, the, uh, the conversation to the security topic. Uh, so I guess it depends on, on the maturity and the profiles of the engineers. Yeah, no, very good. Of, of course, the, the, smaller, the smaller the team, the less the question arises, right? You don't have a separate organization for development and security and all of that. There's just three people there. <laughs> Everyone is responsible. But somebody will be more curious about security than somebody else, right? And yes. that person naturally becomes the security champion. Yeah. Um, what, one of the reasons why other industries have, b by and large, um, kind of adopted the ambassador route rather than security champion route, I think is, is efficiency, right? So if you're now... If you're soliciting non-security professionals to do security, you're spending a lot of time on it, but also you're losing that time from what these people were originally hired to do, which is the future of your company, really. I mean, if you're not building great product, 
you might just as well close shop, right? Mm. Security is a nice to have on top of that, and of course we would think something very important, but if you traded the future of the company for a secure product, that's a terrible trade, right? And so as long as you encapsulate it within the security team, the responsibility, then at least you know that, that the people who are who are building the future of your company, they're doing that with all the attention they can get, right? Yeah, no. yeah, and and on that I think it's it always depends on how much do you embed security in your organization and how intrusive uh, it can be. Maybe maybe you need you are pulling not the right people for the right conversations, and uh, not everyone has is, is interested on security. They might not be have an opinion or want to have an opinion about it. So uh, having external people or outside people that can take care of those topics then let it do a debrief or communicate more faster. It, it, it might be more helpful and more beneficial. Right. Yeah, maybe I can add the adequate security summary here because you know, uh, as a security person, what we do, if I need to define with a few words, look at the threats. Uh, to understand threat vectors, first of all, you need to understand the threat surface. So what is the threat surface? What are the uh, threat vectors? And what kind of security measures we can put? So security teams are not the teams who do everything. We will discuss in a bit, but uh, the thing is that when you try to fund security controls, you cannot do $10,000 cost security measure for protecting $20 asset. So it should be always uh, maybe cost efficiency wise and also the risk based approach. Imagine that if there is no uh, such a thing to protect in your company, why you would need a security team. But this is not the case because at the end, uh, if you have any kind of personal data or if you are connected to the internet, you will need a security. Uh, the one thing maybe security champions uh, program versus ambassador, uh, of course, both of them are some uh, upsides and downsides, but uh, imagine you are building a security champion program and then uh, your security champion left the company. The problem is how would you back up this knowledge and know-how developed for, for example, one year to transfer someone else? And we know that, unfortunately, from the experience, most, most people, when they tend to leave, they don't deliver or hand over their things. On the other hand, with the ambassador program, for example, you don't have to deal with this because you are sharing the responsibility. It's like a cloud, right? So uh, do you want to do it uh, on premises or do you want to work with uh, some cloud technologies? You are just sharing responsibilities and there are some models like, for example, PaaS, SaaS, and infrastructure as a service like that. It is the same for uh, especially ambassador and a security champions program. It depends on how much you would like to own as a company, how much, how much you would like to outsource and share the risk together with, uh, with your partners. Uh, okay, and for that, do you think it, it makes sense to outsource uh, the security part? Because you're talking about having the, the security, I mean, if the champion leaves, then he takes the knowledge and all that stuff, but the ambassador is, is an external organization. What happens if that organization, for, it's, it's a business relationship, right? What happens if that relationship cuts? You are still losing uh, some of that, right? But if maybe the transfer of the information can be uh, less friction between engineers, right? And usually the security champion is an engineer, uh, of course. So are, how, how do you come to the agreement to say, yes, this is, I don't know, a kind of risk that you decide to offload to, a, to a, out outsource it? Or do you really think that it's, you need to think uh, about the reason which ones can be offloaded, outsourced, or which mm -hmm. one? Yeah, I, I think there's, there, there, there's a very, it's a very good approach. When, when there is a hard question you ask to engineers or security people, they will always ask, it depends, right? So uh, it, it really depends. Yes, it depends. But, <laughs> but to what? It's, it's very important. So I think it should be, there's some phases. So uh, from the business perspective, uh, of course, the first thing is, what is your budget? how much money you are willing to spend for security. And this question's answer uh, depends on two major things. The first of all, how much money you, you have, right? So you cannot spend $1 million if you have only $10,000. What is your total budget? And also, what is the risk will be protecting with any kind of program with security inside of this budget? And then you can take a look at uh, maybe with the phases, if it's going to be smarter to start with security champions with your cost budget, uh, with your budget and with your uh, resources you have, you can do it. But if it's going to be not feasible for you, you can start with ambassador. But in, in any point, 
I believe it should be a blend of it. So you cannot just rely on security champions. You cannot just rely on ambassador program mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. with the ambassador program, the risk is that if you don't transfer the know-how internally, uh, your uh, engineers will not learn from the known vulnerabilities and you will see same vulnerabilities again and again. So that's why I believe we need both security champions and also ambassador program uh, in in certain certain moments, so it, it will be like like to avoid a security bias, uh, like on, on always looking at the same internal things or not having like a different point of exactly, view. Of exactly, exactly. Yeah. So on on your question on yeah. whether or not to outsource, I mean you would outsource to me, so I might be a little bit biased I, in I, answering I, that. I know, <laughs> I know. But, and yet I, I see I see many reasons um, why you shouldn't out source in, in certain situations. But let me perhaps start with the two imperatives that, that would make you outsource. One is speed, right? If next to building the future of X, you're also building a security team that just makes X harder to reach, right? You need to focus as a company. And security is, is one of those tasks that you can outsource there by freeing up your mind to, to something more important for the moment, right? That's a temporary reason. If you're growing as a company as Parity has, right, eventually you'll have the, the bandwidth to do 10 things in parallel, and then security <laughs> should be one of them. But if you're a, a startup, security shouldn't be your core competence unless you're a security startup. I think the second um, reason why you would, even in the, in the mid and long term, want to have some level of external support is that different companies make the same mistakes and if everyone, through their own security efforts, have to find those mistakes, which is inefficient as an industry. Mm -hmm. um, we are auditing several dozen uh, projects per year, right? You guys intensely, but many others kind of occasionally. And it really helps to see a mistake only once and then help all of these dozens avoid that mistake rather than ha having to rely on, on kind of the, the, the swarm intelligence of everyone to reach the same conclusion, right? Mm -hmm. So going through an external party as a multiplier uh, can really help, right? But then for all the baseload stuff, the stuff that stays the same anyway, you need to ultimately have an internal team as you guys have built, right? Yeah, yeah I see. Mm -hmm. Because eventually you are still responsible for the security. At the end of the day, uh, imagine like that doesn't mean that if you work with any cloud provider, you are not responsible for protecting data. No, still the responsibility is in the companies and who has the data custodian. Because this responsibility not only coming with uh, some regulations, it's coming with responsibilities that we share with users as well. Because eventually, uh, no matter you do, uh, in some point you will have a uh, users. That means you need to protect their data, their uh, assets that they share with you. And this is the responsibility sharing should be based on the security conscious things. But I cannot say that. Imagine, I'm a security guy. Of course, I will, I will tell all the time security is important. But uh, our job is to show what are the possible scenarios can be uh, happen. And then business owners need to decide should we accept or uh, mitigate. Yeah, and for, for just for, for this one, like, I, I believe it, it depends on the industry, industry that you work on. I mean, we are working on an industry that it's open source. Uh, so I guess we are a little bit more flexible about bringing external scene and looking at what we are doing because it's pretty much public uh, most of the time. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's a little bit better free, I guess, in other industries that they, they are uh, working with trade secrets and also it will be a, a whole different conversation. Yeah, sure. very good. Um, before moving on through, through, through all, I have so many questions for you guys, we'll run out of time, but maybe giving, giving everyone here a chance to ask questions. Yeah. Yep. yeah I do, have a do you want to yeah. grab a microphone just yes. so we hear your different opinion? Yeah. Yeah, so hey. basically, because uh, there are a lot of common practices uh, among all of the front end and the back end as a basic security practices, right? So. For instance, in the in the Web two industry or in tech firms, if you're building a front end, you have to like do like code abstraction on your API calls, right? So that's on the front end. On the back end, you need to set up a firewall uh, for the database, so that I mean, people need people need special special administrative like um, permission in order to access your database. Those are like very basic uh, fundamental security practices, but among I mean, according to what I saw among all of the uh, components of each startup, 
Um, to be honest, most of them don't really have this kind of background. So that's why I think, um, I forgot who mentioned that uh, people should outsource or like at least they outsource their security to other teams, which happen a lot in Solidity, like Solidity community, right? Because you know like there are firms with a couple of business people who don't really know how to code and outsource that to a dev shop in Vietnam and write a bunch of um, um, a smart contract with backdoor, uh, backdoor loopholes and um, go, they rely on the security auditing firms to be their last firewall. So it's like a, um, it's a game theory between like the auditing firm versus the, um, the dev shops, which are, I mean, it, this is, the, the industry is important, right? Because um, it's a industry where your whole asset depends <coughs> on your code or the functionality of, and the life or death of your company relies on your code quality, but you outsource that part to a party that is not really aligned in interest with you, like Sirhan just said. So um, basically what I'm, what I'm trying to deliver is that I agree the opinion that we should have some basic understanding or like some common, um, how to say, the least, uh, least minimal common knowledge among all of the developer, um, especially for uh, Polkadot ecosystem or like Ethereum ecosystem or like Solana, so on and so forth to tell them, hey, these are the steps that you need to follow because there are a lot of developer who turn, either turn from Web2 or turn from like zero coding basis. They're not gonna, because um, I graduated from Berkeley and we have a co core course in our CS track, CX, CS160, uh, computer security. So we have to take that course in order to graduate. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't been trained like professionally throughout the whole process, security one-on-one, you have to take it. Uh, design pattern one-on-one, you have to take it. You need to have a sense of security and sense of engineer, like computer engineer, to make sure that you are building a solid product. We, we appreciate the comment. I, I, think, yeah. I think the point has been well made, yes. Yeah. Um, absolutely, yeah. Um, I think full, full, full agreement, just, just a, a, a couple of thoughts. Um, you're, you're talking about kind of the holistic security of an operations, right? Yes. Um, there was firewalls and probably want to include things like social engineering resilience and all of that. Um, we, as much as we're working on these topics, it's kind of out of scope for what we, what we brought today to the developer conference, Sub-Zero, right? Um, I'd love to do this again, talking through red teaming, right? Where we t take a, a much broader uh, mm -hmm. approach and say, how can we hack this company any means possible, right? Um, so here we're really focusing on the code. How do you get the code right? What do the developers have to do to keep it secure? But a company, of course, is not just determined by the code quality. I mean, in, in, in this world, the DevOps is probably more important than the, the, the Dev, and um, many more mistakes are made there. And uh, yes, those are completely avoidable mistakes, and it would be good to take CS whatever number at Berkeley to, to avoid those mistakes. And for those who haven't, haven't taken that course, it'd be good to have some baseline controls, right? Again, not so much for developers, for the, but for the ops people. Yeah? Um, any, any comments from yeah, you guys? At, at least, at least from my, I, I understand that, and I think it's a little bit more of awareness of, on the industry that mm -hmm. engineers are, are working on. I mean, if you are working on blockchain technologies, you, if you don't think that you need to, to consider security or security practices, you, you might not be having a good understanding of the, of the, of the market where you are working or that you are trying to uh, push a, an adventure or, or whatever. Uh, so I, I do believe, I mean, I share some of the, some of the thoughts that uh, as an engineer, if, if you are really not preparing yourself, I mean, you're prepared as of on, the, on whatever the framework or whatever chain that you want to build, but if you're not preparing yourself as a, as a security engineer, like an engineer that has a uh, strong uh, base uh, on security, uh, you are putting, you're putting yourself in a, a thought situation. And uh, I'm, I'm a believer that uh, how can you evaluate something that you don't know? So if you are going to be talking with auditors and uh, you don't know about security, how can you actually evaluate the, the output of the auditor? How you can actually ask them to, to audit something? So I do believe that there's, a, there's some weight that is implicit in the market for, for the engineer that is working on that. 
Yeah, I mean, echoing what Gil has said, because um, basically, as an auditor, um, you're a third party, right? You're not building the product yourself. You have no better understanding than the developer yourself, right? So you are only like third party, like not like a reliable, not even reliable source, because it can have like completely different understanding of the project that you build, right? So the main point is still that even if you only have like three persons, uh, three people startup or like four people startup, you still need to have the sense of security, a like very basic sense of security, on um, at least the know-how on like what you have built and how to make it secure. Like, and then you let other people <coughs> check. It's just like a teacher and student relationship. You have to learn it yourself. Your teacher is the resource to help you. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks for the comment. Def yeah. Definitely. Maybe I can add quickly two things. So thank you very much for expanding conversation. So you touch very important topic that nobody looks, which is requirements when you hire a developer. So uh, for example, the Berkeley example, there is a hard requirement. You have to pass this uh, lecture without, you, you cannot move forward. But my question is, how many founder or HR people looking for security requirements when you hire developers? Limited to my experience, but it's almost none, none to less. So if we don't have a security conscious hiring, hiring projects for uh, uh, mindset for hiring developers, it's not going to help for the later st stage. And as an example, uh, how it starts for parity, especially ambassador program versus non-vulnerabilities especially. So we real realize that the, uh, finding vulnerabilities, it's faster than fixing them because the external party already specialized finding them very quickly, but our internal resources needs to specialize also fixing them. And uh, how we can do this, we can do this both security champions and also both ambassador program. We decide, decided to do it most of time, both of them. So we had security champions from the each projects and uh, internally, and also we had the ambassador program. But in some points, we all realized together with SR Labs, so there are common mistakes each time. Then we realized what should we do? We should create a knowledge base for our internal developers and also the ecosystem, which is known vulnerabilities. For example, top mm -hmm. 10 security risks in our code base. And then we designed a training. We designed uh, some of the things developer can use, like uh, games and uh, resources. It, it helped people to... Uh, improve their process. And also, it's very important. When you onboard a new developer, they don't know the common vulnerabilities, right? So we need to pass the information to tell them, hey, welcome to the team. Please don't do this mistake, because every new uh, developer do yeah, the Just like how you train the internal, like train the internally onboarding new engineers, right? Just get them a, how to say, like the best practices of how to code the using the substrate. I mean, we, we've exactly. been talk, talk about this since last <coughs> June or July, right? I mean, that's something that we should do. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And the hard part is, unfortunately, so information, it, it is not something that you can give people. It is something that you can only take uh, as an individual. So information is out there, knowledge is out there, but it depends on individually coders, developers, engineers to accept them mm -hmm. and, and take them. Otherwise, uh, we are not going to enforce people to teach them you should do input validation. Yeah, example. of course, they're not incentivized, right? Because, I mean, if you're a parity employee, if you don't do it, I will fire you, right? <laughs> <laughs> but there are individual developers. So, I mean, the resources out there, right? Just, like, let the people just... We can only suggest that we can't force them. Right? Let, let, let's, let's use those, those thoughts. You, you mentioned um, s somewhere in your comments um, that we need to uplift everyone to, to kind of a common security level. Make sure that, that even the even the least educated on security participants in the shared ecosystem reach a baseline level. Now, we, we talked about the Substrate Builder program and how that very successfully helped dozens of the project at least have an, have an understanding that security is important, not necessarily knowing everything about security yet, but making it not the unknown unknowns anymore, but at least known unknowns, right? Um, now is the, the Builder program uh, phased out. Um, what are our thoughts on who should now be responsible in educating the new joiners to the ecosystem? Any thoughts? Uh, at, at least, um, uh, I, I mean, I, th I think it's it's a tough uh, tough question that it's linked to, to the conversation that we had before. Uh, I would say, I mean, has. 
from the engineer perspective, I guess I see it more in an individual matter, and I will, I will initially will make myself uh, responsible uh, for, for that, mm -hmm. and I will make myself uh, as an engineer also, as someone that is working either for a patient or for something in, in, in blockchain technologies. Uh, like be able to have the responsibility to keep up myself and see exactly what is happening in the ecosystem. Like in the ecosystem, there's a lot of hacks, uh, there's a lot of vulnerabilities. Then it, it will be my responsibility initially by uh, uh, to take a step uh, to the front and say, yes, I need to take care of this because tomorrow that could be me. Uh, now, uh, I think it's it's more about uh, from again from the engineer perspective uh, how I how I can. Uh, Making more agile the communication between all our teams, how they what they are doing, having these open discussions about what they care about and what what they really are not looking into, uh, especially because people have different levels and standards and baselines. Uh, and I think th this comes with the external uh, <laughs> view or known by the bias mm -hmm. that you can have internally. I guess uh, even outside of the not talking about an uh, audit company or a security company, but. Uh, an ambassador or a or security champion can come from another project, uh, from a blockchain. So you're saying if somebody starts fresh into Substrate, they have the first proof of concept, they're building towards something great, but it's, it's nowhere near launching, they should contact you. How can you help us? What, what, what documents can you freely share? S set ourselves up for this journey, okay? So that's the first step. Yeah. What does somebody do after that? So, uh, probably I go up to the, the <laughs> upper left corner, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I can give you an example very quickly. So finding bugs, it's kind of like finding an expert to uh, come to my house. It can be a problem in my house. Could you please look at it? And experts come in, dude, you have a hole in your wall, and this can be devastating for you. And it's then probably a leak. You, yeah, <laughs> you know the problem right now. Before you didn't know it, you could sleep. Now you cannot sleep. If you are not going to fix it, it's going to be a problem because you know it. And imagine... <laughs> You produce a very safe car, but the safety of the car and everybody's safety it depends on the driver. Which means uh, companies like Parity uh, allocate many resources to do secure products. But it depends the ecosystem, how implement they, they uh, in a secure way. That's why there is a program called Substrate Builders Program. That's why there is a program called Polkadot Audit Legion. Because it's about the baseline security. Imagine there is a company who spends $10 billion to secure the ecosystem, let's say. And then uh, there is a startup who has only $100,000 for the uh, one-year budget with two developers. So if their implementation is not going to be secure, you are just wasting your money. Ten, your $10 billion for nothing because eventually at the end of for business there's still the residual risk and you are not managing the risk and there's hacking and there's, 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 there, there are problems. So that's why as, as, as a next step I believe ecosystem always needs to create uh, maybe just not, not only one company but as a consensus of security initiatives that will help new joiners because this is the way we will see most vulnerabilities coming from. So it's not going to come from probably uh, experienced engineers, but it will come from starters, especially. Maybe the, yeah. this is the best thing we are doing uh, in this room, the starter room, so it uh, would be helpful for everybody. Yeah, you, you mentioned cost a couple of times. I think it's, it's um, important that, of course, security doesn't come for free, but projects are well taken care of through most of, of the phases. So you start off, you write an email to Geo, he'll send you some, some documents, you're, you're already better off than before, Parity is going to pick up the tab uh, for, for that, right? Um, you start um, implementing fast tests through free and open source software. You have internal processes now that can bring out bugs. You eventually um, encounter the need for uh, a more substantial audit, you turn to the Polkadot Audit Legion, they'll pay something up to 80%, I believe, um, of the auditor fee, right? Really, the main thing that you need to bring to the entire effort is attention, right? Somebody else will pay for most of the steps, but the attention of, of keeping the, the topic of security relevant for, for your organization, that has to come from you. You can't pay somebody else to have attention within your organization, right? And I think if, 
if as a community we, we all agree that diagnosis is important, but healing is the next step. That is what mostly deserves and requires your attention, right? So no excuses not to get started, right? Given that, you know, there's so many free resources available or insurance schemes where somebody else pays for it, right? Um, but you really have to start this journey with the attitude to, to pull through, right? To do the healing as well. Don't sit on the pile of bugs. And I think with, with that, we're, we're pretty much exactly out of time. Uh, thanks again to Sound and Tio for doing this. Thank you very me. much. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, guys, very much for an interesting discussion. And actually, if you have any questions, we still get like one minute or two because there's a 20-minute break afterwards. So anyone? Yeah. Actually, my, I might have one. I was kind of wondering, you presented like, you know, four means of actually finding the bugs. So, so which of them is the most effective one in your opinion? Like, um, you know, they ever mentioned like bounties, you know, like common initiatives that, do, you know, projects pull together to actually fund the audits or the audits themselves, right? Right. I think that there's short-term remedies like bug bounties and, and paying somebody just to, to do an audit. I think those are not the most effective. I think what's most effective is to really invest into your thinking and your speaking about security. And that but really- That's is, the hardest one. That's <laughs> the threat model. If you don't have a threat model yet, it'll make all the difference to work with an external partner, write a threat model. It will really focus the attention to where it's needed. And then everything else becomes easy after that. Yep. Yeah. All right, thank you. Creating a security culture. Yeah, there you go, yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys, for really interesting thoughts. Captain, yeah. Captain. So now we will have a 20 minutes break. So we are welcome in our room, you know, in 20 minutes. So make some, you know, refreshment and please see you again.